Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. Every donation and Patreon supporter will get a thank you on the air and throughout my social media. Don't forget, I have two other podcasts out there, From John to Justin, which releases every single Friday, and Pucks and Cups, which releases every single Tuesday. I do all of this full-time, the writing, the research, everything, so every dollar you give helps keep it all going and it goes straight to me, no one else. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram and TikTok at Bairdo37. You can also find me on YouTube where I put up weekly YouTube videos. Just go to youtube.com slash C slash Canadian History X, and that's E-H-X. The area around Smithers, called the Buckley Valley, has been home to the Wet'suwet'en people for thousands of years. In fact, a 1997 decision by the Supreme Court of Canada affirmed that they have the indigenous title to the area, and the name of the Wet'suwet'en roughly translates as People of the Lower Hills. Throughout Smithers today, you can find artwork by these indigenous people in the downtown core of the community, including a stunning totem pole display at the Coast Mountain College campus. The founding of Smithers came about thanks to the railroad, as with so many other places in Canada. The Grand Trunk Pacific Railway was being built and there was the plan to have two major divisional points in British Columbia in 1913. Prince George was chosen as the first divisional point, but a second one was needed. And after going through various options, news came through that there would be a second divisional point built in the Buckley Valley. Developers and speculators then believed that the divisional point would be built 5 kilometers east of Telqua, in a place called Bulkley by developers. The speculators began to promote the area as a future city and a major trade center even though the spot had not been chosen yet by the railroad. What the speculators had not considered was that 15 kilometers to the west of Telqua, at the foot of the Hudson Bay Mountain, the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway established its headquarters in a new town that would be named Smithers, after Sir Alfred Smithers, the chairman of the board of the company. The Vancouver Daily World would report, quote, Smithers was selected after a most thorough study of the great empire traversed by the Grand Trunk Pacific, not only as the most suitable spot for railway operation, but as the only logical place for a city of importance. End quote. The same year, the Railway Commission approved the new site to be the second divisional point. By April 1913, surveying had begun, and by August, 100 of 160 acres for the town site and rail yards had been cleared. The rail reached the area in July, and the first passenger train arrived in October. As soon as the first passenger train came through, the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway began selling plots. But they soon found that it was not easy to build at the town site due to the subsoil being layers of quicksand and clay, requiring pile driving for building foundations. They would complain to the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway, but the railroad company did little to remedy any concerns. Landscape architects would design the street layout in a design created to accommodate upwards of 10,000 people and for decades the community would follow the initial layout created when Smithers was first founded. By 1914, Smithers had two newspapers, two banks, three churches, a hotel, several stores, a telephone and electrical system, six rooming houses, five restaurants, four stores, a doctor, dentist, hardware store, two lumber yards, and much more. At this time and for decades to come, the railroad would continue to be the largest employer in the entire community. In order to keep up with the building boom, the Seymour Lake Lumber Company was established, producing 10,000 feet of lumber every single day. In 1913, the St. James Anglican Church was constructed by residents of Smithers, and for the next 60 years it would serve as a spiritual center for the community, as well as the main location for community events in Smithers. In 1975, the parish would move to a new home, and the church was left empty and soon fell into disrepair. Thankfully, it was not demolished, and in 2005, the building was restored and turned into a community hall. From that point, the church would become an important part of the community, hosting weddings, lectures, parties, meetings, and more. You can see the church to this day, arguably the oldest building in the entire community. In 1914, an event would spur on the growth of Smithers when Telqua, a town near Smithers, was hit by a terrible fire that destroyed 13 downtown buildings. This would cause many business owners to relocate to Smithers. 
By this point, Smithers had 125 permanent buildings and 700 residents. Developers expected the community to have 5,000 people by 1915, but the population would actually fall to 350 by 1918 and rebounded only slightly to 520 in 1920. It would not be until 1991 that the town would reach 5,000 people. In 1915, a temporary train station was built, and four years later in 1919, a new and permanent train station was built. The new two-and-a-half-story building became a defining feature of the community and was rare for being a custom-designed station by the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway. This was also the largest train station built in northern British Columbia, and this building remains in the community to this day and is the second oldest building in Smithers. For its importance to Smithers and the surrounding area, it would be made a Heritage Railway station in 1989. In December of 1921, Smithers became the first incorporated village in British Columbia. The Interior News would report, quote, Smithers is now officially declared a village under the Village Incorporation Act, and the ship of state of this community emerges from the placid inland waters into the Sea of the Unknown, and whether her course will be tempestuous and her progress barred by rocks and the uncharted channels is right up to the people of Smithers, who are now members of the crew of that ship. End quote. In 1921, Smithers would go through two nearly disastrous fires. The first would cause $10,000 in damages and was contained at the power plant and cold storage plant. Then, only a few months later, two hotels burned to the ground. And while both of these fires were tragic for the buildings lost, the quick work of residents and firefighters kept the fires from getting out of control. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I've spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms, and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. In 1930, there would be a sudden bit of gold fever in Smithers when gold was found in the Glacier Gulch, about 5 kilometers to the west of Smithers. This quickly sparked up mining attention in the area as prospectors began to arrive in the hopes of finding gold. The Vancouver Sun would report, quote, Since the first surprising assay return was received early in that year, this ore has been assayed by six widely separated companies of strong repute, and they all found the heavy gold content in what was been under development as a bismuth showing. End quote. While there would be no Klondike gold rush to Smithers, mining and the search for gold and other minerals would become a major economic driver for the community for decades to come. An issue from Smithers would reach the British Columbia Legislature in March of 1932, when Stephen Hoskins was let go from public employment as a government agent after 30 years, losing the salary he had relied on for years. The Vancouver Sun would state, quote, Practically, every resident of the district, regardless of political affiliation or religious belief, had signed a petition protesting against this action. End quote. There was no suggestion of inefficient work or failure to perform his duty. Dr. H.C. Wrench, the MLA for the area, took this issue to the legislature, stating that Hoskins had been let go so that a friend of a government official would be given the job instead. He would say, quote, This was a remarkable and unjust method of rewarding party friends. End quote. Unfortunately, it seemed to fall on deaf ears and nothing more was heard about the issue. In 1973, Smithers would get a new mascot in the form of Alpine Al, a seven-foot-tall structure carved with a chainsaw that featured a man with a long alpine horn to welcome residents to the community. The resolution from the town stated, quote, Whereas Smithers is well known in the Pacific Northwest for its fine winters for skiing, snowmobiling, skating, curling, jam pail curling, and other winter sports, 
And whereas Smithers is known far and wide as a friendly town for its good shops and good people, therefore it is resolved that we encourage this trait by adopting an alpine theme in our business district architecture to relate to our mountain and winter sport heritage. End quote. The statue was adopted as a symbol of the new alpine theme of the community, and the statue would soon become a symbol and mascot of the community. Unfortunately, time would take its toll on the structure, which resulted in fiberglass coating in 1996. It was then replaced in 2016 with a new seven-foot statue that was carved from a thousand-year-old red cedar. Seven feet tall, the traditional type, iconic, yet new and improved, chiseled from 1,000-year-old red cedar, he's Alpine Al. Alpine Al the first is a wooden statue that was installed in Smithers Main Street in 1973, but its time ran out as the elements wore it down. Jorg Young owns JJ's wood art. He created the new, improved, and taller Alpine Al that was installed today. Hi, JJ. Hey, hello. So what does this statue look like? Well, um, given the challenge of doing not just an Alpine man, uh, they asked me to do a replica of the original statue. Uh, it looks as close as possible to the original, which you can imagine like it's a seven-foot standing uh, life-size guy uh, dressed in a trouser and a, and a cape blowing into an Alpine horn. And you did some research into the old Alpine Al. What did you find out? Uh, not much at the time. I was given uh, the idea of, of recreating the new one. I didn't know what the story was behind the original one, but today I found out after meeting the guy who originally brought in this statue from the Lower Mainland to the city of Smithers, which was, like you said, in the 70s, late 70s, well, pretty much before I was born. <laughs> it used to be an original wooden sculpture which they brought up, and then, well, yeah. The time was not too good to it, and they had to do a fiberglass mold around it, which even was done in the 90s, and, and by now uh, didn't withstand the weather anymore. So they asked me to recreate a new one out of wood. What do you think made Alpine Al so iconic to Smithers? Well, the town of Smithers itself, they pretty much uh, put him up on the main street and made it the uh, guardian of Main Street Smithers. By now, I think uh, they printed him on pretty much everything in Smithers. You, you will see him on, on local tourist information center and, and printed on signs, downtown Smithers and all over the place. So it, over the years it grew uh, to an icon of the town. Smithers has also made its mark on television and in the movies. Eight Below, starring Paul Walker and Jason Biggs, was partially filmed in the community, as was The Grey, starring Liam Neeson. The comedy network show Alice, I Think, was set in Smithers, and Smithers was referenced on the show How I Met Your Mother. If you want to learn more about Smithers, you can visit the museum. This museum features historical artifacts from the community's history. First established in 1967, the museum has over 3,400 items that date back over a century in Smithers' history. There is also the St. James Anglican Church maintained by the museum that I mentioned earlier in the episode, which is the centerpiece of the community and continues to be used to this day. There's also the self-guided walking tour that will take you along the route that highlights the history of some of Smithers' oldest buildings. And you can find a guide online and at the museum and town office. And it's a great way to spend a sunny day and to learn about the history of the community firsthand. I will close out this episode by looking at an interesting fact about Smithers. Despite its small population, it's produced a surprising number of NHL players. Joe and Jimmy Watson would play for the Philadelphia Flyers in 1973-74 and 1974-75, both winning the Stanley Cup with the team, while Jimmy would appear in five All-Star games and played for Team Canada at the 1976 Canada Cup, often considered the best team ever assembled. Joe would appear in two All-Star games, and both brothers are members of the Flyers Hall of Fame. It doesn't stop there, though. Alan Kier played for the New York Islanders, Detroit Red Wings, and Winnipeg Jets, while Dan Hamius played for the Nashville Predators, Vancouver, and Dallas, and won gold with the 2014 Canadian Olympic team. Michael Wall played for Colorado, and Ron Hominuk played for the Vancouver Canucks. Lastly, there's Ron Flockhart, who played in the NHL from 1980 to 1991, playing for the Philadelphia Flyers, Montreal Canadiens, and St. Louis Blues. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at the community of Smithers, British Columbia. If you did, please leave a rating and review. 
If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. And you can donate to the podcast by going to canadaehx.com and clicking donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Vobs, Robert Page, Richard D., Colin Johnson, Katie Caldwell, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, an anonymous patron that I truly do appreciate, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseeth, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.